All right, thanks everyone for joining today uh, as we resume our international BT talks. Um, it's been a, a big hiatus for many reasons, some personal reasons and obviously um, the summer holidays, I guess if you can call them holidays this year, but um, just giving everyone a little bit of a break. Uh, but we have the pleasure of uh, hosting uh, Victor Bazan today. He's um, joining us from uh, Badalona in Spain. He's going to give us a, a master class in 12 lead ECG localization of VT substrate. Um, I met uh, Victor a couple of years ago in uh, Bogota. Um, we, we were part of, uh, of a meeting that uh, Louis Science hosts uh, every year at Cardio Infantil. And um, I was, I was, I mean, I, I had read his uh, papers uh, when, and when he was at Penn and have heard a lot about him. But when I, when I listened to his talk about ECGs, uh, he made it sound so simple and so uh, practical that um, it, really, um, it really gave me a new perspective on how to use the 12 lead ECG. And I'm pretty sure today he's gonna deliver us another great talk and is gonna uh, help us with tips and tricks and how to identify you know, VT exit sites, but also, as I understand, there will be more information uh, coming to us today regarding uh, VT substrate. So, so we're looking forward to your talk, Victor. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here today, and thanks for taking the time to prepare the talk and, uh, and join us. So welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Alejandro. Thanks for the invitation. It's an honor to be here. Um, and hello, everyone. I hope uh, Hope for the best for everybody. Uh, these are difficult times, but I hope that the situation um, gets better in the near future. Let's let's hope for the best. Um, and, and without any other preliminary, I will start by uh, first of all uh, modifying a little bit the uh, the title of my talk. I have been told by Alejandro to talk about the EKG. Uh, localization of the BT substrate, but let's take advantage that maybe not in many cases, but in some cases at least, we have information, we have EKG information, not just from the VT EKG, but also from the baseline EKG. Um, and I would also, I, I would like to uh, make a, a whole evaluation, a whole analysis of uh, a combined analysis of uh, the uh, usefulness of both the baseline and the VT EKG with the aim of uh, characterizing the VT site of origin or region of origin at least. Uh, I will also try to uh, give, a, give you some hint about how can we infer the type and the extent and even the localization of substrate uh, by means of the baseline EKG and also by reading the VT EKG. And um, this combined analysis will also be useful in terms of assessing the arrhythmogenicity and refractoriness to treatments such as like uh, uh, VT uh, ablation we can offer to the, uh, to the patient. Uh, let me state up front that I accepted that uh, talking about uh, EKG in the area of, uh, uh, of substrate-based BT ablation is like not being exactly at the cutting edge of the wave and I accept that uh, up front. Probably this won't give me an authority but uh, as uh, Stendhal said, to give to have notoriety probably is not the main the main target shouldn't be the main target uh, for for any of us. Actually, if you take a quick glance to my uh, biography, um, my scientific my publication background, I have always come back to the EKG because I consider myself a simple person, and the EKG is a simple tool. And what, what I like the most from the EKG is that it most of the cases, it mostly uh, makes sense. And this is something you don't get from many other tools we usually on a daily basis. The EKG usually makes sense. There are some exceptions, but 
um, in my perception, these, except, uh, these uh, exceptions are, are very few. Um, to start, I think we have to accept that uh, the use of the EKG is nowadays limit, limited in the field of PT ablation because um, we don't usually pay so much attention to the clinical VT because uh, now the procedures, the VT ablation procedures are focused on substrate modification um, and this technique is overcoming nowadays a, a more clinical VT uh, guided ablation. But even in this, uh, even in this, uh, in this situation, uh, I think that uh, I will try to justify during this talk that the use of the EKG of both uh, BT and, and, and baseline, rhythm, uh, baseline uh, rhythm is still important. And I, I will tell you why. First, uh, the clinical VT is still important. Is still important. It is still important to regionalize uh, the origin of this VT because it makes a difference in terms of pre-procedural planning and in terms of also of a patient's um, informed consent. It's not the same to plan for a left ventricular VT ablation or a right ventricular VT ablation and some, uh, and, and, and some other aspects. Um, we also can take a look to the baseline EKG because we many times will have a sense of the arrhythmogenicity and, 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 and therefore the refractoriness to ablation the patient we are going to put on the table is going to have. So by this means we're going to have a prognostic uh, assessment of this patient. Um, we will also assess uh, for the probability, for the possibility of a prominent epicardial substrate and this will give us a hint of how the, this patient could uh, work out with uh, a salt endocardial VT ablation. So in this area of substrate-based ablation, I will still talk about the EKG for regionalizing its site of origin, for characterizing the, uh, the substrate, and for analyzing the potential arrhythmogenicity this patient can have. It's a little bit out of the topic. This is the outline of my talk, but given that uh, outflow track BTs usually occur in the setting of no underlying uh, disease, I will kind of skip this last part and I will focus on the, on the former two. Uh, I will start by um, showing, showing how important it is still now still in this area of substrate-based ablation, how important it is to regionalize the uh, VT origin. The classical justification for the importance of regionalizing the VT was that the damage, the, the, the damage to the uh, arrhythmogenic tissue had to be limited because causing significant damage to uh, uh, a, a normally functioned ventricle would be jeopardizing for the uh, for the patient, um, and this was in the area of uh, surgical uh, VT uh, ablation. But uh, nowadays, we, we also have a justification in terms of the need for VT EKG regionalization. We have to define the ablation strategy, and we will use the confrontation of the clinical VT with uh, the substrate localization because sometimes we may find uh, a VT originating from a region that is apparently distant from the imaging localization of the substrate of, of this patient or in some other instances we can have a VT that appears to originate that has characteristic uh, characteristics of a non-ischemic of a non-ischemic um, nature in a patient who has ischemic VT. 
and these are uh, characteristics, the, these are uh, features that are worth uh, determining upfront. Of course, to uh, reach the left ventricle or the right ventricle or both ventricles in terms of uh, ablation strategy will always be important. The assessment of a probable epicardial origin of the VT will always be important. And also differentiation, the differentiation between a septal origin, there, there might be a risk of uh, AB block, there might be a lesser uh, or a poorer uh, control outcome after BT ablation in, in, in septal substrates. There might be the necessity of, uh, of bipolar ablation, wire mapping, whatever. And in terms of free wall BTs, we may encounter patients uh, who may need uh, a combined epicardial or uh, plus endocardial uh, ablation. We may encounter intramural uh, substrates uh, substrates like those we uh, we have in patients with with in some patients with popular muscle BT. So uh, by this means, in terms of pre procedural planning, it is extremely important to have a sense of the region of origin of uh, of the uh, of the ventricular arrhythmia. The classical criteria you are all familiar with them. I won't uh, enter into detail with that. We use three main criteria, the QRS axis, the bundle branch pattern in V1, and the precordial R wave transition. And by only using these three, um, these three parameters, uh, we get a very good sense, Let's, we, we, we have to uh, underscore this, a very good sense of the uh, ventricular tachycardia region of origin. These are classical criteria. Um, and this classical, uh, and, um, this classical uh, criteria settled the following principles. Uh, first, uh, we don't have to pursue a correlation between the baseline uh, QRS morphology or duration with the uh, QRS axis width or uh, cycle length during BT. There is no correlation. So, regardless of um, of a bundle branch pattern in baseline rhythm or the curious duration in baseline rhythm, we won't expect to, uh, expect to have a, a linear correlation with the curious width or other uh, parameters during, during BT. Another aspect is that all left ventricular BTs with a left bundle uh, pattern in V1 uh, come from the left ventricular septum. This, this is a settled principle. This is a Quite, quite a rule, and, and it's uh, and it's usually it. But I will I will comment on that in my in my next uh, slide. The next thing is that um, all right ben, uh, right bundle BTs arise uh, from the left ventricle. I will also comment on on that because we may get to some exceptions to this mm, very important rule. Um, and the truth is that. Uh, we cannot use only one lead in order to ascertain the exact region of origin of VT, of the VT, with only two exceptions. If we recognize a QR pattern in lead one, and in V1, in V2, and in V6, in V6, and we are in the setting of ischemic VT, the origin will be anterior. That's, that's, that's going to be for sure. Uh, and all VTs coming from the left ventricles with an R, a pure R wave in lead one, so no S in lead one whatsoever, are uniformly uh, coming from the best posterior basal aspect of uh, the left ventricle. This is only talking about left ventricular tachycardia. For basal superior VTs in the left ventricle, we use the neg negativity of AVR and AVL because it's a, it is a very, um, um, a rule that, that, um, that usually works very well in this, uh, in this setting and helps us to differentiate between a septal and a lateral localization of the ventricular arrhythmia in this basal superior uh, 
left ventricular area. And of course, we use the R wave uh, transition pattern and the in a positive or a negative uh, concordance to uh, uh, establish a perianular basal BT or an apical or a, a apical septal BT uh, respectively. I was commenting on the possibility of exceptions to the rules. Now, the Marcelinskis, because this paper has just come up and uh, the first author is uh, Frank's uh, son. Uh, I didn't know that Dylan was, was running so fast to the, uh, to the professional field of electrophysiology. But this is an interesting paper because uh, it uh, gets, it takes you to realize that uh, right ventricular, uh, 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 right bundle pattern in V1 can still or um, indicate a right ventricular origin of the ventricular arrhythmia. And this is especially or essentially particular to patients with right ventricular cardiomyopathy and very dilated uh, uh, right ventricles. So this at least underscores the importance of keeping in mind the heart's anatomical disposition and the cavity, uh, the possibility that the cavity, the cavity's dilatation may play a role in fooling you in terms of uh, following these this, this rules. Um, the classical regionalization has been taken over by, uh, by, by other criteria. And I think it's always important to uh, take a look at the new information. But before we kind of uh, translate this new information uh, into the clinical practice by forgetting the, uh, the conventional EKG criteria, we have to be, we have to be uh, very strict. For example, you can pick your favorite EKG algorithm that has lately come up. Uh, this algorithm has the advantage. I won't, I won't get, I won't get into the details. You have the, the, uh, the information uh, referred in this, uh, in the, in this slide. Um, we have the advantage by using this uh, algorithm that this segmentation is exactly the one that is performed, it is made during MRI imaging. So you can have a straight uh, correlation of the EKG information during substrate based ablation uh, using MRI. That's, that's an advantage of this, uh, of this EKG algorithm. Enrique from the Penn Group developed a very comprehensive algorithm initially, initially uh, constricted, to, uh, constricted to patients with idiopathic BT, but I think that it also applies to uh, most ventricular origins and most uh, substrates. And we also have additional uh, criteria that, that, we can be, that we can be using, for example, this one by Siegel who focused on patients with ischemic uh, ventricular tachycardia. I think it is important to uh, take into consideration the substrate. Uh, it was used, uh, the substrate, uh, the, the underlying substrate of, of the population from, whom, from which uh, the EKG criteria were developed because it can make a significant difference. The truth is that you can use these new criteria, these new algorithms, but you uh, have to keep in mind that excessive segmentation may become counter counterproductive. And this is because, because of two reasons. First, there can be very contiguous BT origins producing very different EKG, dramatically different EKG patterns. And um, this is one of the aspects. The second aspect is that inversely to that, you can have similar EKG patterns uh, belonging to uh, sites that can be even se few centimeters apart from each other. So 
um, I mean, segmentation and regionalization is a fair approach to uh, have a sense of where the VT comes from, but we have to give it the exact importance. So we don't we don't have to uh, to overstate the importance of this uh, of, of of this aspect of uh, of the EKG uh, of the of the VT EKG analysis. Also, as it was highlighted from the first beginning by by Miller, the regionalization can be useful for a proportion of VTs, uh, up to 75%, but a lesser percentage in patients with uh, a right bundle pattern uh, in, 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 in V1. So once we have discussed about the regionalization by means of the use of the EKG, I will analyze as a whole the uh, analysis of the EKG by assessing the, by characterizing the, the VT substrate, assessing the arrhythmogenicity, and uh, assessing for a possible epi versus endo exit site of the VT. We, we're we're going to use the combined information to make this whole, this comprehensive uh, analysis of the substrate we have underlined. Let's start by right ventricular cardiomyopathy. Uh, patients with right ventricular cardiomyopathy have a typically epicardial to endocard toward endocardial process of fever fatty replacement, um, usually with the strength of surviving cardiomyocytes at the intramyocardium or even toward the epicardial substrate, which are uh, surface, I'm sorry, which are usually responsive, at least at the initial st uh, stages of this disease of the ventricular arrhythmias that these patients have. There's also the possibility of thick fib fibrosis at the uh, subendocardium that may, may make the VT not amenable to endocardial ablation. This is something that it has to be kept in mind. And Fermin uh, Garcia and other authors have highlighted the importance it, or the predominance of an epicardial substrate of, uh, on many of these patients, probably most of these patients, especially those who have failed a previous endocardial, endocardial ablation, but not only these ones. So in these patients, we, have a, we can have a hint, we can have a notion of, uh, of the SCAR localization and extent by means of analyzing the, uh, the, um, the baseline EKG. These are the, uh, a bunch of the criteria that have been developed in terms of, uh, uh, in order to uh, assess for the localization of the scar, the extent of the scar, and even of, uh, about the uh, arrhythmogenicity of this scar and, this, and, and its uh, progression. Especially the criteria that become useful the most are those who uh, take a look at the depolarization, more likely than, uh, than the criteria looking at the repolarization um, uh, defects. So you can have a selective QRS prolongation, you can have uh, extensive epsilon waves, you can have a QRS prolongation and other EKG features that will tell you about the possibility of a prominent scar of a progressive uh, disease uh, in the setting of uh, right ventricular cardiomyopathy. Given that in many cases, right ventricular cardiomyopathy is exclusively or essentially affects the right ventricle, there is a typical uh, decrement in the voltage of the right precordial leads. And if you put this in comparison with the whole voltage uh, of the precordial leads, you can get to a, uh, an amplitude QRH ratio that will tell you about a prominent right ventricular uh, substrate. Something similar happens with QRS fragmentation, a concept that has been a little bit further developed by, by Corey uh, from Penn um, a, a while ago. If you get to see fragmentation, which you can, um, you can determine either 
uh, in the setting of uh, narrow QRS or, uh, uh, or, or um, wide QRS complexes, um, you can uh, differentiate the location and the extension of the uh, and the extent of the uh, of the um, of the scar tissue. For example, if you have um, epsilon waves just belonging to a particular uh, EKG EKG location, that will tell you about a, a, a single localization of the substrate. But on the contrary, I'm sorry, if you have uh, a more extent distribution of uh, epsilon waves that is probably telling you that you have a more pronounced substrate potentially also affecting the uh, left ventricle and we'll, uh, we'll uh, tell you more about that in, in, this, in these two slides. Of course the left ventricular uh, involvement in the setting of right ventricular cardiomyopathy has a huge prognostic impact, not just in terms of BT recurrence after ablation, but also in terms of uh, morbid mortality. And uh, we also can pick up things from the baseline EKG that will tell us about a possible origin, a possible involvement of the left ventricle in this uh, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. This is an example that was published three years ago of three relatives with, the, with a confirmed uh, disease, one of them without any change in the anterolateral leads, which are the, the ones you have to take a look at if you are looking for uh, left ventricular involvement in the, second, in, the sec, in the setting, I'm sorry, of right ventricular cardiomyopathy. And in this first patient with RV affectation, no significant, only mild Q waves or decreasing R waves in, uh, in these lateral leads were, were seen. This patient over time did not develop LB affectation. On the contrary, here we have a, patient, a relative of the former patient who from the first beginning presented with, left, with prominent left ventricular involvement. And in this patient, very tiny R waves in, in, in lead one with pronounced Q waves and also um, uh, very negative uh, QRS complexes at the, the left precordial leads were, were noted from the first beginning, as I said. And this is something you can assess over time because the third case, the third relative was a patient who initially did not have left ventricular affectation. He, di he did have um, right ventricular uh, disease, but over time he developed EKG changes that were suggestive of a left ventric a progressive left ventricular involvement, and this uh, was uh, confirmed by imaging by e imaging techniques. So it gives you a sense of a left ventricular involvement to have some changes in terms of Q waves, decreasing R waves or epsilon waves in these anterolateral EKG leads. Of course, you can always take a look at the VT EKG if you, have the, if you get lucky and uh, you, don't, uh, you don't only uh, have um, ICD strips. If you get lucky and you get the 12 uh, lead EKG of the VT, you can also take a look at, uh, a look at the morphological criteria suggesting a possible epicardial origin. Unfortunately, at the right ventricle, no interval criteria suggesting an epicardial origin are useful at all. And as you know, these morphological criteria are as simple as uh, taking uh, a look at a locally representative EKG lead and seeing how the transmural initial uh, vector of ventricular depolarization behaves. In case you have a positive initial component in lead one, you will know that for basal superior, basal lateral, left ventricular arrhythmias, you will have, you will have an initial R wave in this lead and you will get a QS complex if you have the uh, other direction, if you have an epicardial uh, origin. And as you apply these 
to the most uh, frequent sites of origin of BT in the setting of right ventricular cardiomyopathy, you have to take a look at the lead that is confronting the anterior and the low RBOT aspect of the right ventricular free wall and see how V2 uh, behaves. It, if it behaves with a QS complex, you can infer that there's maybe, there's probably an epicardial origin of this VT. And on the contrary, you have to suggest an endocardial origin. And the other most frequent origin of VT in the setting of right ventricular uh, cardiomyopathy, the basal inferior uh, right ventricle, you will have pure QS complexes in the inferior leads uh, during epicardial VTs. And on the contrary, if the um, VT arises from the endocardial counterpart, you will have, you will get an initial, although tiny, R wave in these inferior leads. It is interesting because uh, the uh, EKG assessment makes, can make a difference. And sometimes not just for confirming an epicardial origin in this setting of right ventricular cardiomyopathy, but to confirm an endocardial origin of the tachycardia. Most tachycardias in right ventricular cardiomyopathy arise from intramural, intramural or epicardial exit sites. And when you get an endocardial exit, sites in this exit site in the setting of right ventricular cardiomyopathy, you have to suspect an advanced stage of this disease. And maybe in this situation, you can get rid of the BT by, uh, by only um, exceeding the endocardium for, for ablation and even uh, exceeding the epicardium uh, can be dangerous in these cases. So, so always take a look at the EKG apart from other uh, techniques uh, in order to minimize the damage to the, uh, to the patient and to optimize the BT ablation strategy. Uh, let's move to ischemic cardiomyopathy. Um, there has been a huge change in the, uh, in the type of uh, patients we are dealing with in terms of ischemic cardiomyopathy. The uh, conventional cohorts of patients were usually patients with transmural myocardial infarction, but um, in this new era, it's not as new, of uh, a fast access to uh, coronary reperfusion, we've ha we have come up, we, have, we are encountering substrates that are less transmural, that are more heterogeneous, um, and uh, therefore we have increased the likelihood of an intramural or and even of an epicardial exit site or prominent substrate in this, in this uh, EM, ICM uh, substrate. And this, and this is the rule in many, in many of the publications which have um, gone again and again around the same concept. The uh, scars in ischemic cardiomyopathy are not as dense, as compact, as homogeneous as they used to be. And this has changed probably the history of um, I, of VT uh, uh, ablation in this in this setting, there are still some classical uh, EKG criteria then that can be used uh, to a certain um, AVT origin and AVT origin in a patient with uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy. The classical criteria of a key uh, of the identification of QR complexes are highly suggestive of ischemic VT, are highly, the, um, this, uh, have, make a, a, a high, a, a very uh, easy differentiation between VT and SVT. Usually no SVT behave with QR uh, complexes except for uh, AVR, so when, when you have a white complex tachycardia, the presence of a QR complex is telling you about uh, ventricular tachycardia uh, origin of the arrhythmia and particularly uh, of an ischemic uh, nature. 
And there is a third component of the identification of these QR complexes is that um, many times this can be indicative also of the uh, region of origin of the, of the ventricular arrhythmia. And I have to say that as you go uh, over the, uh, the conventional information we have about that, this only accounts for patients with, uh, and with a previous uh, anterior myocardial infarction because other locations do not uh, behave as well in terms of reproducibility of QR complexes in both the baseline rhythm, the baseline QRS, I'm sorry, and the VT uh, QRS. I was commenting about the possibility, the higher likelihood of an epicardial substrate in the setting of uh, of uh, ischemic VT in these um, in these uh, in, in these cohorts of patients in the fast coronary reperfusion area. Uh, actually, the interval criteria were originally developed from patients with ischemic VT, and uh, we can also um, use the, uh, the the maximum deflection index, although it was not developed for patients with uh, ischemic VT. But we have to keep in mind that these criteria, these interval criteria are highly dependent. The cutoff we use for the definition of the, of the uh, uh, of, uh, cell to delta wave, intrinsic deflection time and shortest RS complexes. Um, they are highly dependent on the region of origin of the ventricular arrhythmia on the presence or absence of underlying uh, conducting system disease and also are highly dependent on the non-ischemic or ischemic underlying substrate. So um, take a look at a pseudo-delta looking uh, QRS complex, probably in terms of measuring and using the described cutoff maybe you have to use it with a little bit more cautiousness. Finally, interval criteria, I'm sorry, morphological criteria could be useful in this setting, but as long as we don't get uh, baseline key waves uh, because they, the assessment of key waves um, to characterize a probable epicardial origin in patients who already have baseline necrotic key waves uh, can, can, be, can be misleading. Probably uh, the, uh, the, the landmark of arrhythmogenicity in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy is again QRS fragmentation. When you, uh, when you come up with a significant QRS fragmentation, especially uh, corresponding to more, uh, to two or more um, contiguous EKG leads, you have to have a sense that this patient will, uh, will has a myocardium with a, uh, with a particular arrhythmogenicity. And this has been proven in patients um, who are bearers of, uh, of, um, of ICDs. In terms of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, and probably now I'm moving to, to, to the last uh, substrate, um, it is a simplification, but I think you can, we can use this uh, differentiation between two patterns, an atheroseptal pattern with, uh, with, uh, with uh, sometimes exclusive sep septal affectation and a basal lateral, inferior basal lateral pattern. Uh, in terms of the former, usually you have to infer the presence of an anteroseptal non-ischemic pattern pattern when, when you have a patient with underlying uh, severely depressed left ventricular function and also with a diseased uh, conducting system uh, uh, as manifested by a first degree AB block or usually by a, a left bounded branch block. In these patients with uh, an anteroseptal pattern and non-ischemic VT, the only thing you, you have to keep in mind is, is that VT in this setting is less frequent than in the setting of 
basal superior VTs, non-ischemic VTs. But if you have VT, this VT is going to be much more uh, recurrent regardless of ablation, and it's going to be much more refractory to uh, any of the treatments you can offer to the patient. One of the signs I like the most be because it's a very specific sign of a septal VT origin and also a very specific sign to differentiate from uh, SVT is that if you get a narrower QRS complex during VT than, when, than what you get during baseline rhythm, this is telling you that the patient has a septal VT. Um, this is a strip uh, a friend of mine sent me in a patient with non-sustained runs of tachycardia. He didn't know it looked like a supra, or look like of a supraventricular origin, but as you take a tight look, it seemed like these are the baseline, the baseline uh, complexes. And as we use the very fancy calipers we usually use in Spain, we certainly came to the conclusion that this patient had uh, a septal VT with uh, VA uh, dissociation. So a very specific sign, a very, um, in my opinion, a very uh, a beautiful sign, I would say, but it's not, it's not quite often to, uh, uh, to see this. Um, an isolated and tiny septal VT substrate is not usual, but it's possible. And in these cases, um, probably you may have some sort of uh, baseline conduction impairment, but many other cases you don't get too many things and you can all, only pick up this uh, substrate by using unipolar mapping. And again, this uh, substrate even of, uh, of an isolated nature can be very refractory to uh, ablation and the use of antiarrhythmic drugs. Um, we have a way to differentiate a non -scheme, a, 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 a basal lateral scar in terms of differentiating whether it comes from a non ischemic pattern or an ischemic pattern. And it, is, it was described by the PEN group um, a while ago. And we also, in terms of arrhythmogenicity, can only pick up patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and take a look at what happens at the R wave in V1 and what happens at the S wave in V6. And we can get a sense of the arrhythmogenicity of these patients because it's an indirect indication of a prominent basal lateral subject usually of a mostly uh, epicardial uh, location. Of course, this basal superior, basal lateral uh, left ventricular region uh, in the setting of non-ischemic uh, cardiomyopathy are the perfect scenario for morphological criteria, the most valuable of which is the identification of a, Q, a pure Q wave in lead one that will give you um, probably even the confirmation of an epicardial origin in this particular left ventricular region. Of course, you have to take a look at the whole EKG to make sure that the QRS complex you are analyzing actually comes from this particular left ventricular region. And you also get the potential of uh, putting this, uh, um, this criteria uh, along with other modified interval criteria into a very uh, highly sensitive and specific algorithm to have a sense of an epicardial origin for BTs. This is one of my last uh, slides, and this is very important. If you have um, a, 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 a not too much extent substrate at the basal superior uh, region in the setting of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, usually you come across uh, basal VTs. And if in the setting of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, you identify EKG markers of an, on, of an apical LVDT origin, uh, this is a very strong indicator 
of a uh, very evolved, uh, uh, even to an end stage uh, phase of this of this disease. So please take a look at the possibility of apical DTs in the setting of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy because it it, it uh, can give you um, uh, a very important clue in terms of a patient's clinical outcome. Finally, QRS prolongation has been incorporated into uh, 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 an EP risk score developed by Dave uh, Frankel, um, uh, also suge suggesting a poor uh, clinical outcome of these patients. So I was mentioning that QRS prolongation is particular to the anteroceptal pattern, but if you identify such QRS finding in the setting of, of a, a basal superior, basal lateral a scar pattern, you have to um, get a sense of a, a, a very diseased uh, myocardium. And finally, uh, in terms of the Brugada syndrome, I will, I will just go very fast over this because um, the take home message in Brugada syndrome is if you get funny uh, patterns of Brugada, you have to be uh, aware that this patient is probably more arrhythmogenic than, than as compared to patients with a more classical type 1 Brugada pattern. So be aware of that. Um, also, it, it is uh, worth it to take a look at, at a bunch of other criteria in patients with uh, Brugada syndrome because um, we are very limited in terms of prognosis, prognostic assessment in these patients, especially for primary prevention. So I always, um, in my patients, make a very compre comprehensive analysis of the baseline EKG, especially when it comes to the decision of whether this patient deserves or not an ICD in terms of uh, primary prevention for, uh, for sudden cardiac death. So I think this is important and I, I would recommend you uh, to uh, take a look at all of these criteria and um, you know, if, if you get to, uh, get to realize that some of this criteria uh, is particular to your patient, uh, you have to be aware of a, of, a, of, a, of a higher risk, okay? And finally, towards in terms of the early repolarization, it has been said that uh, patients with idiopathic VF who also have associated an early repolarization pattern, especially belonging to the inferior or the lateral EKG leads are subjected to a higher arrhythmic, uh, a higher risk of BF recurrence. Well, this is something that has has to be further investigated because we have kind of uh, contradictory data on that. So I said I would skip that. I won't comment on the um, on the importance of the EKG in the setting of outflow tract tachycardia because this is not the, uh, the topic today. We today are talking about uh, substrate uh, identification by means of the EKG, but at least let me emphasize how important it is nowadays, the EKG in this scenario of outflow tract uh, tachycardias because it's, uh, it's, it's much more precise uh, then uh, in other case scenarios of uh, underlying substrate in order to precisely determine an exact site of origin of the ventricular arrhythmia. That's by one side. And, and this will help you also to uh, plan for the procedure and be aware that maybe you are going to be, uh, you will have to be using some technical um, aspects uh, if you get to uh, have intramural or epicardial origins within the outflow tract regions. Last slide is uh, 
how will this be going on in terms of the usefulness of the EKG in the, uh, in the setting of uh, substrate characterization and uh, in the setting of, uh, of substrate-based ablation techniques. Uh, my guess is that the, um, the next step for the EKG is to be a very functional, a very dynamic part of the, uh, of the ablation procedure. And I don't know exactly what I'm talking about, but um, probably we will get to some sort of incorporation in real time of the EKG into the ventricular arrhythmia for characterizing EKG patterns that will tell you um, how to focus on a very specific uh, region of uh, of the substrate in, in order to be uh, to be more specific in your in your ablation. Probably we'll more we will know more about that in the uh, in the near future. And this this is pretty much it. So thank you, thank you very much for your patient uh, patience, and I am open to to questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victor. That was a, that was a very great talk. Um, I'm glad you incorporated all this uh, substrate uh, assessment because it really uh, adds another layer of, you know, understanding and you know the usefulness of the ECG in ischemics and non-ischemic substrates. I think it's oftentimes um, uh, undervalued, underappreciated. So having an expert. Uh, guide us through some of these important metrics I think is very valuable. Um, I wrote down a few questions while we wait for our audience to come up with their questions. Um, so, so relating to your last slide, you know, the, the future directions, um, one of the areas where ECG, um, you know, ECG imaging is very in vogue nowadays for, um, you know, Non-invasive mapping, you know, radiation ablation, and 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 you know, integration with, you know, scar maps uh, to localize exit size, maybe to look at patterns of activation. Um, do you have any experience with vector cardiography? I know this is an area that, you know, was used many years ago to uh, help localize the origin of certain or patterns in. Uh, um, you know, bundle branch blocks and uh, even on VT, um, you know, exit sites using, you know, the, the XYZ coordinates uh, in a, I guess it's a simplified version of, a, of, a, of an ECGI that we use nowadays. Do you have any experience with it or any thoughts on it? Uh, I do not and my sense is that we will get to use some sort of vectography um, in the near future. Maybe something more advanced that what was used back in the day with the X, Y, Z. Um, um, you know, I, I do know of one of the one of the ECGI companies uh, that we worked on. Basically, uses a twelve lead ECG to generate vector maps, which are then transferred into a color map to help you understand. You know, um, not just not just the exit side, but uh, because they're analyzing the whole dimension of the QRS. Um, and the and the repolarization, they're giving you an idea of substrate as well. I know it's still very early days on this, but I do I think know. that I do okay. think there'll be a, a, a an incorporation of these uh, ECG I'm assessments sure into it. Sure that uh, it's going to be incorporated, and um, the other thing is that I, the other function of this uh, vectography. I think it, it'll be to pick up some um, depolarization abnormalities, fragmentation with a much higher sensitivity than the conventional 12-lead uh, EKG that will make a difference in terms of, uh, of determining the arrhythmicity of the patient. So yeah, I think we're going to be using that. In the future. Yeah, and, and that brings me to my next question uh, regarding the you know, QRS fragmentation, because, um, you know, be beyond, you know, localizing, you know, extensive scar in someone with, um, you know, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy or someone with an extensive non-ischemic, you know, we, 
we always look at, at you know, improving our metrics for risk stratification in, in ischemics, but especially in non-ischemics. As you know, there is a big gap in, in, in knowledge regarding, you know, um, how to predict risk of ischemic events in non-ischemic population, because most of the primary and secondary ICD trials looked at, you know, in essence, ischemic population. So I think the, you know, the, the, the ejection fraction cut off, cut off to decide if someone gets an ICD or not works best, although not perfect for ischemics. But in non-ischemics, you know, there's a huge debate at the moment regarding how do we restratify these people? And I've always thought, and with some evidence, you know, there are some, I guess, anecdotal and some case reports and some small case series looking at, you know, the predictive value of QRS fractionation to predict the rhythmic events. And, 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 the, and, and the reasoning behind this is, you know, QRS fractionation gives you uh, an indication of subgrade for both ischemics and non-ischemics. Um, do you see this QRS fractionation, fragmentation, however you want to call it, as a potential risk stratifying tool for those patients that we still don't know what to do? I mean, we're putting a lot of, at least in the US, we put a lot of ICDs for primary prevention in non-ischemics, and we know the number needed to treat is one in 20, maybe even more, so. The, um, my main issue with the, with QRS fragmentation is the sensitivity, the sensitivity, mm -hmm. because I don't, I don't, especially when you are exigent and you are trying to um, confirm QRS fragmentation in two or more contiguous EKG leads. So it, it makes a difference from mm -hmm. one to two, and it makes a huge difference from two to three contiguous EKG leads to uh, notice EKG fragmentation. So I think you don't get that often, uh, mm -hmm. um, a very remarkable EKG, uh, QRS fragmentation in two or three uh, contiguous EKG leads. So I think in terms of uh, a screening for patients to an ICD, and especially in this area, in this era in which we are putting an ICD just based on the ejection fraction and that's it. I think um, probably the, um, the, um, the role of uh, identification of QRS fragmentation is not going to be as, as important in this, in this setting. I, I, I have uh, my concerns about the sensitivity, the sensitivity of, the, uh, of this particular parameter here. Right. Do you think it's because of the... I guess uh, the ability of the 12 lead ECG as we use it today to detect this yeah. and maybe future improvements in ECG technology, maybe ECGI in some way could quantify or, or pick up, you know, um, low amplitude QRS fragmentation. I am pretty positive about that. Mm -hmm. uh, that can, um, that can be a, a major role of EKGI. I'm, I'm pretty positive about that. But then we will have to reassess the whole diagnostic accuracy of this, uh, of this new, of this new EK, EKGI based criterion. Mm -hmm. but maybe we get we uh, move to the to the other extreme of the uh, of yeah. the of this um, yeah. diagnostic right. assessment. Right. Um, you know, one of the things that I've always liked about the ECG criteria, which we always use in the lab, not just for localization, but also to have some idea of scar substrate is, you know, the cost effectiveness and the availability. You know, it's avail they're available everywhere. You know, everyone has access to the ECG and in many labs um, around the world, um, you know, the imaging resources are expensive and not always available, especially when it comes to MRI and PET CTs. Um, so in, in your practice, um, you know, in your cases, your patients, how much, stock, how much stock do you put on the ECG when you take someone to the lab and how much do you rely on additional imaging techniques? You're talking about substrate-based uh, yeah. yeah, primarily, yes. Yes, correct. 
Well, that's a tough question because that depends on who is going to be performing the ablation. <laughs> no, I'm asking about your practice, your personal practice. Because if, uh, if I ask an, an imaging expert, I know what answer I'm going to get. But I think I might get a slightly more balanced answer from you. What is that? I am. I consider myself a very romantic person, and uh, I learned to do uh, and to. Uh, I learned to do video ablation by using entrainment mapping, mm -hmm. and by taking a very uh, and, and and by paying a huge attention to the clinical VT and its mm -hmm. variance during the. Uh, during the VT ablation procedure. And, it, and for me, I, I had to accept the numbers, uh, but it has been a hard time to accept that we had, we had to move away from the clinical VT. Uh, but the numbers are there, and, and, and I think it's, it's out of the question to discuss about, uh, about them. So my actual approach is usually to uh, perform the substrate ablation and always I try to induce and mm -hmm. I always uh, pursue getting rid, especially of the clinical VT. So mm -hmm. I won't stop the ablation until uh, I get rid of the clinical VT. And probably I will, more f I will be more flexible by inducing other non-clinical VT. That's, that's what, <laughs> what I can, uh, you know, afford in terms of still uh, getting back to the clinical VT EKG. Right. And uh, do you do you use uh, do you use MRI or CT or any other imaging uh, routinely? We lately are use, uh, are using eyes in, uh, in are, are, are doing many of the procedures with uh, with cartosound. Mm -hmm. And depending on the case, we also have MRI integration with characterization with 3D characterization of the of the scar, but not for all cases. Very good. Um, now, one last question, uh, Victor. I don't want to take too much of your time because I know it's very late in Spain. Uh, but you guys like you know late nights and yeah. going out for some tapas and some vino. So maybe <laughs> may, maybe you have some plans to do that later. But before you do that, one last question. Okay. Um, so in terms of anteroceptal substrate, comparing ischemic, you know, the classic ischemic anteroceptal substrate, you know, from an occluded LAD, occluded diagonal, versus that non-ischemic substrate, which is less arrhythmogenic, but you see it from time to time. And as you mentioned, it tends to be a kind of protected substrate. Um, from a pathophysiology point of view, we know they're very different. And what are your thoughts on why is this substrate in non-ischemic so tricky to respond to the ablation? Is it because it's mostly intramural? Is it because it's localized on a high septal site? And so accessing it is either difficult or limited by the you know, nearby structures. You know, you've got the coronaries, you've got the conduction system, you've got the outflow tracts right on top of it, you've got epicardial fat and so on. So what are your thoughts on this kind of tricky substrate? Probably I cannot, I cannot give you an a straight action, uh, answer to this question. It's a, it's a tough question, but I can give you an intuition of that. I think it's a mix between uh, a very intramural substrate and a protected substrate. So I have the sense that in many occasions, the actual uh, critical part of the VT circuit gets protected by a surrounding area or more of more compact fibrosis, which makes the critical parts of this VT substrate simply not amenable to mm -hmm. endocardial ablation from sometimes either the right ventricular septum or the left ventricular septum. And this, this is just simple, simply because um, uh, the, uh, the radio frequency, frequency lesion cannot penetrate through this uh, a compact area of protection. That's that's the sense I I I get when when I'm I'm facing this kind of, of uh, substrates. You know, and and with a lot of these you know anteroceptal substrates, there's been you know developments such as you know bipolar ablation, um, changing your irrigate to have normal saline or D5 to increase you know transmission of the.
um, you know, uh, of the radio frequency energy. Um, you know, there's been some work on needle catheters, which are kind of a very cool idea, but it, it hasn't really become a mainstream. I don't know if it's probably because of, um, maybe there's not so much interest from the companies because you know the technology gears towards AF ablation, so the VT ablation on the market is a small share. Um, but what about electroporation? Do you think there's a role for electroporation as a potential way to overcome a lot of these protected substrates? I don't have any experience with it, but I've seen very promising preliminary results, I guess. Me neither. I don't have experience at all. I have been told that it is a very promising um, sort, sort of energy for, uh, for tough uh, BT substrates such as this one. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I have a, a similar sense as the one you had without personal experience, but uh, the feedback I have gotten is, 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 truly, is truly positive. Very so good. We'll see about that. Yeah, yeah, time will tell. Hopefully we can see that in a meeting in the near future without many COVID restrictions, maybe everyone will be vaccinated and we can all, you know, sit down at a table and, you know, drink some wine and chat about the success of electroporation and, you know, septal VT substrate, so. I'm very much looking forward to, to that. Yeah, well, well, Victor, thank you so much. I know you, 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 you took some time uh, to prepare this talk and it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful talk. Uh, I'm gonna prepare the talk and 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 post it on on our YouTube channel very soon. Now, uh, I know there's a lot of people that had interested in this talk, but because of the time constraints, sometimes it's very difficult. I I know one of my old fellows from New Zealand was logged in. He had to scrub in to do a case, and some of my other colleagues from Australasia were very much looking forward to it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna get this ready for them as well. Um, I want to thank you because, uh, you know, it truly was an amazing talk and uh, I think we've all learned a lot from you today. And, um, you know, I look forward to seeing you in the future, hopefully, hopefully in Barcelona, right? That's the next uh, ESC or EHRA. No, it's ESC, right? Yeah. Next ESC is Barcelona. So that, that's, 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 that's one that's going to be hard to miss, COVID or no COVID, I have to say. So, all right. We'll see about that. Thank you very much for having me. My pleasure, Victor. We'll we'll speak soon, okay? Thanks everyone. Take care. Bye bye. Take care.